Bullshit. He watches his mother shoot his father three times in the back. I'm Mr. Blackman, damn the puppy. I look like Quasimodo to you. What about Johnny Lauer? What about China? Big speech of the deathbed. Well, that reminds me of the TNA show that I watched tonight. Let me tell you all something about TNA. A lot of people think that I hate TNA. Apparently, I've gotten this reputation as a TNA hater. That's not true. I even got I even heard that I had the reputation of hating the TNA wrestlers. Absurd. You deny this claim. I deny this claim. This is what upsets me about TNA. I watched this TNA show tonight. It was an hour long. I believe in the end we got three matches. We got a match involving Rhino and Homicide. We got a match involving Chris Sabin and Kaz. And we got a match involving AJ Styles and Tomko. AJ Styles and Tomko actually was was fine. Uh, it was it was it was a fine main event. Nothing spectacular or anything like that. The other two matches were fucking awesome TV matches. I just watched them and I thought. Holy shit, this is great stuff. Meanwhile, they were sandwiched in the midst of the most shitty show I've ever seen in my whole entire life. And I realize I've said that, what's 52 times 5? Approximately 250 times or 260 times in the last five years when watching TNA. But what a useless fucking show this was outside of the fucking great matches. That's... My problem with TNA, I watch TNA and I get so mad and I get so frustrated because I realize, you know what, this fucking show could be awesome. This show could be awesome every single week, the pay-per-views could always be awesome, and instead, week after week, they find a way to just bring utter bullshit into the program. Let's recap this show. Okay. It opened up with a speech from Jim Cornette in a bright yellow jacket. And he alerted us that Jarrett had been dealing with some very serious family issues, therefore he wasn't going to be there. The Jarrett versus AJ Styles match was off. He said he had to make a very tough decision about tonight, about AJ's match, and suddenly out came Christian. He said they were going to have a little party right now. Cornette was not invited. He said he wanted uh, Cornette to raise. By the way, he said he wasn't invited, then he asked him to do tasks. But I'll just skip that part. He said he wanted Cornette to raise AJ's hand and declare him the winner. He's angry about what happened at the pay-per-view, how he got screwed out of the title. He's angry that Jim Cornette is a bad businessman. He's angry that Cornette has signed Tomko to a series of, of matches. He's angry that Cornette has not told him who his opponent in the King of the Mountain qualifier is. Now, that's, I believe, five things. Can you name the first thing he was angry about? I can only remember the, the part about not knowing his opponent. So anyway, uh, yeah, he's angry about so much stuff that uh, it's impossible to remember everything he's angry about. So he's he's ranting and ri- raving, and, and Cornette said, uh, listen, um, I was going to have AJ win via forfeit because Jarrett's not here, but because you called me a bad businessman, I'm going to make him have a match with Tom Coe. So AJ freaked out, and, and Christian said, calm down, we'll handle it, blah, blah, blah. But first off, who is my opponent in the King of the Mountain, Jim Cornette? And Cornette said something about how he he knew this person or something of that nature. I, I'd utterly forgotten because they immediately cut away from this segment, and they were backstage with Borash. And uh, he said there had been hirings and firings and guys who wanted to come to TNA immediately. And if you want to know more, TNA Mobile. Text uh, fuck off to one eight hundred TNA sucks or whatever it was, and plugged he shilled the hotline basically. He in fact has become mean Gene Okerlund. And as he's speaking, up comes Chris Daniels, and he says, "Daniels, what's going on? What's this deal with Sting?" And Daniels says, "Well, you know, Sting 
Uh, I'd gone to him for enlightenment, and he sent me down this path. I have made my choice, Sting. Make your choice. And at that point, they cut to the first commercial, 14 minutes into the show. Now, if anybody listened to that that didn't watch Impact can tell me what they uh, what they talked about first, who was involved, and uh, and recap this entire thing, you're a genius. You are an utter genius. This was just too much stuff going on all at the same time. And I don't want to hear the excuse about they need two hours, because even with two hours, there was no reason all of this stuff needed to be recapped. No reason whatsoever. So... After the commercial, at the 14-minute mark, they returned for more talking. Right. They were in Cornette's office. Letitia was there. She was with Eric Young. No Jim Cornette. She wanted to know what he was doing in the office. He was upset about Robert Roode. God damn that Robert Roode. Trying to fire me and make my life miserable. And then he walked Cornette. And then after Cornette came in, in came Robert Roode. And he started yelling at Young. And he slapped him around and that sort of thing. And Cornette said, stop. Stop slapping him around. Listen, if you want to slap him, if you want another opportunity, let's have a match at the pay-per-view. And Rude said, great. And Cornette said, Eric Young, if you lose, you're fired. And uh, Robert Rude, if you win, uh, if you lose, I can't remember the stipulations. It doesn't matter. But uh, basically, the gist of it was that that Cornette said if Robert Rude won, he could do whatever he wanted to uh, Eric Young, fire him, uh, hang him from uh, something, or burn him, which... uh, Sounds like a really shitty deal for Eric Young. So he's ranting and raving about Eric Young, and then in comes Bob Backlund. He's angry that Alex Shelley has stolen his book. And he's ranting and raving about his book and a drug test and and calisthenics or something of that nature. And Cornette screamed at him about something of which I have utterly forgotten and stormed out of the room. And we are now 16 minutes into the show and not one thing that I have seen thus far meant a goddamn thing. It did not make you want to see any matches in the future. It did not make you want to get pay-per-views. It did not want to make you see the main event. It did not make you care about any characters. It just made your brain hurt. Chris Daniels versus Rhino. Rhino came down to the ring, and as Chris Daniels was coming out, the match did not start. Oh, no. Because Sting ran out, and he attacked Chris Daniels. And they fought all over the place, and they fought over the barricade, and they fought into the crowd, and they fought up into the people. And meanwhile, Rhino just stood in the ring like a jackass. And they fought, 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 and they fought. And And then finally they cut back to Rhino, and he said, God damn it, I came here to fight tonight. I am issuing an extreme challenge. I must interrupt you. They cut back to Rhino. Before he spoke, the first thing he did was to thrust both fists in the air as if he had done something great. Yes, I have done something great by doing nothing here. An extreme challenge, he said, straight out of ECW. Out came Conan and LAX. They got in the ring with Rhino. They said it was clear that TNA had done something against them, trying to strip them of the titles and such. He called the uh, Team 3D the Dudley Brothers, which I'm sure will get them a legal letter from uh, Jerry McDivitt. He was uh, ranting about this and that when he saw Hector Guerrero in the crowd. That's right, Hector Guerrero. So he began to bury him. He called him washed up and challenged him to a fight. So uh, Hector Guerrero jumped the barricade and got on the ring apron. And today said, my God, we may have a tag match here. So they cut the commercial, and when they returned, Hector Guerrero was gone. Conan was at ringside, and Rhino was facing homicide. Not a tag match. No, a singles encounter. This, in fact, was a great match while it lasted. That's the thumbs up. So, as they were having the match, suddenly Hernandez jumped up on the apron for a distraction. And then Hector jumped up for a distraction. And then Homicide hit Hector, and Rhino gored Homicide and pinned him, at which point LAX jumped in the ring. Conan hit Rhino. Hector made the save. They beat up Hector. Then Chris Harris came out. Conan began beating him with a crutch. And uh, it was a Rudo beatdown, which ended, and uh, they immediately cut to Samoa Joe. I totally forgot Hector was out there. Samoa Joe cut a promo. Angle walked up. Actually, Samoa Joe had not even gotten one word out before uh, Kurt Angle came out. Called him Coconut Head. Tough words from Kurt Angle. He's a fighter. They brawled, and or they uh, got into a verbal uh, sparring battle. Angle said, I'm a fine, upstanding gentleman. I like to warn people before I cripple them. I'm going to cripple you. And Joe said, well, I hope you do it before I cripple you. And uh, that was that. So they went to commercial and they came back, and we got more talking. Total nonstop talking here on the show. AJ, Christian, and Tomko 
having a big argument back and forth. AJ was going nuts that Christian had told him he was going to help out his career, but instead here he was wrestling that fucking goofball Tomko. Christian said, listen, we're all friends, blah, blah, blah. He said the better man would win tonight and then everything would be cool. At which point Tomko grabbed AJ by the neck and said he was going to make it short, sweet, and painless tonight, which did in fact end up being a lie. Then we had Chris Saban and Kaz in a non-title match, which again, fantastic action. Until suddenly, as they were going to the uh, com- uh, the near falls at the end near the comeback, all of a sudden, Raven's dudes were up in the nest, just standing there, looking stupid. And this distracted Kaz, and so Chris Saban beat him, and they immediately cut away. We did not find out why these men were up there looking stupid. We did not find out what happened afterwards. We just had more men on the show, in just two- to get them on the show. In 2007 in TNA, this is a clean finish. BJ uh, James cut a quick promo, running down Basham and Damage, and then we had a quick segment with Sanjay Dutt promising a new Sanjay Dutt next week. Can't wait. Which apparently is a major selling point, which led us to the main event, which was AJ and Tomko, which before it got started, out came Christian. And he sat down in the uh, announcer's booth apparently to do commentary. They had a uh, two-minute match before a three-minute commercial break. When they came back, AJ was working him over, blah, blah, blah. During the middle of the match, out came Joe. Joe decided he needed, or I'm sorry, Angle came out first, but then out came Joe, and they stared at each other. Neither man tried to cripple the other. They just stood there and stared at each other. So they brawled and brawled and brawled in the ring, and then finally AJ tried to get a chair. Tomko kicked it. Uh, near fall, and then we had uh, AJ, I'm sorry, Tomko and Christian having a tug of war over the chair, which allowed AJ to pin Tomko to advance in the King of the Mountain qualifying match. And so the show ended with Tomko chasing Christian, Joe and Angle staring at each other on the ramp, and whoever was left in the ring, pacing in the ring, AJ, celebrating or whatever. So three things going on at the same time in the span of 15 seconds, and at that point they immediately cut to the show-ending video, which apparently is more important than letting any of this bullshit sink in. Remember when Tomko pinned Joe? That's all I got. This show sucked. This is a bad, bad television show. Why can't you just get the good stuff in TNA and focus on that? Why do you have to focus on all the bullshit? Why does everyone have to talk all the time? Oh, no. Who the fuck cares? I, 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 we only have an hour. What, what, you need more time for talking? I don't want to see any more talking. I don't remember anything that happened on that show. I wrote, uh, let me see how many words I wrote to, to, to try and recap that whole goddamn thing. Uh, 1,422 words, which is more than I type for an average Raw report, which is a two-hour show. What does that tell you? There is too much shit going on. There's too much shit going on. You're trying to tell me this show would be better if I had two hours of this shit? You have 2,800 words. I don't need 2,800 words. That's true. 1,422 is too much for a one-hour show. And no, Nobody could watch TNA and say everything about this promotion sucks. No one could possibly do that. Because there are things about this promotion that are good. So, why? Why can't you focus on that stuff? Does TNA get letters going, man, that fucking segment with Bob Backlund and Eric Young and Robert Roode and Letitia and Jim Cornette, that was so awesome. But it it was better that one day where you also had Chris Harris and James Storm and the two girls brawling on the desk all in the same segment. That was great. Do they get letters like that? They can't. It's impossible. So anyway. So this show sucks. And when it was I'm, over... I'm numb to it now. When it was over, could I have given a shit less about uh, the pay-per-view? No. no. In fact, when it was over, could I have given a, given a shit less about next week? No. What did they promise? There's going to be a match between two former champions. Yes, they, they put up the graphic. They, my, they didn't give names. No, no. My, the selling point is two former champions. Right, they announced there will be two former champions facing off next week, and the graphic came up, question mark versus question mark. I can't wait. Two former champions are going to square off next week. I think one of them is uh, Abyss. Abyss's big return after that awesome truncated angle, I might add, a month ago. His big return 
they figured it was more important to, that it would be a secret than to bill the big return of abyss. Right. Sure. Two yeah. former champions. In TNA, that could be any of a hundred men. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the other factor. It could be ten thousand men. That's supposed to be uh, supposed to be a selling point. I think of men who've been champions in TNA. Maybe even Skipper will come back. TNA could have just said Abyss wrestles next week. Tune in. He hasn't been around in a month. He returns from his brutal beating. He returns from his brutal beating. Hey, Taking revenge on his punishers. Let's show you some footage of his brutal beating. Here he is getting the fuck beat out of him, which required uh, over 50 stitches. He's back next week, and he's mad. No. That's too hard, apparently. Two mystery former champions. Two former mystery champions. They should have said two former TNA champions, and then it could be no one. There's a swerve for you, Russo. Hope you're listening. Anyway, thumbs down. Uh, yes. I can't say that. Thumbs in the middle. The wrestling was great. Everything else sucked. Therefore, thumbs in the middle. <sighs> I've worn myself out. You've worked awfully hard there. <laughs> All right, let's get into TNA. Robert Roode and Jerry Lynn actually had a hell of a TV match here. Yeah. Jerry Lynn is, God, 43 or something like that. And When's he going to learn to hit the ropes? Well, that's that's another... That annoys me to no end. Well, it's everyone learns a different way to hit the ropes, and I'm not a big fan of the way he does it, but I think that he's hit it for so many years that it's never going to change. It's always the wacky one hip on and one leg up, and and, uh, <laughs> and neither is that hairstyle and the metal god that he is. Well, he is a metal god. What kind of hairstyle do you want him to have? Did you ever hear him on our show? Yeah. On Yada? Yeah. I you know, we it. never had women calling Yada, but we had a ton of women calling, I believe, when Matt Hardy was on, and also when Jerry Lynn was on. Hmm. He was so popular with the ladies. Oh. And 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 very very rarely has a guy come on and the chicks just all come out of the woodwork. But something about Jerry Lynn really did it for it's these be the hair. young lasses. So anyway, they uh, had a good match and and Rude beat on him after the match. They did a low blow fisherman suplex finish. Yep. And then Rude shoved Tracy. Here's okay. Hold on a second, everybody. No, no. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <sighs> this, as I said, was the best TNA show of the year. That said, there was a lot of bullshit in this show. <laughs> Stuff that was just horrible. Mm -hmm. As I've mentioned many times, if they just focused on what was great, this show would be awesome every week. Instead, there's too much focus on stuff that's shit. Mm -hmm. Now, among the stuff that's shit is the fact that every match, there can never be a match on TV that just ends. Clean finish. No, not even that. Just yeah. a match where when it's over... Right. It's over and we move on. And then there's there's always something that comes next. Every match is a backdrop for an angle. Yeah. There's always a post match right. angle. Always, always, always. So this match, we had the match, and then we had the post match angle, mm -hmm. which was Rude shoving Tracy and Eric Young and and it, uh, something happened. Anyway, the point and was Eric Young came in with a chair. Thank you. And um, he was threatening to hit. Hell of a job. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He was threatening to hit Tracy with it. Of course, the crowd was totally behind him. By the way, Eric Young rules. And um, then Cornette comes out and said there's not going to be any, you know, man-on-woman violence in this. And by the way, Tracy Brooks, who doesn't wear sleeves and then cuffs? Did you notice the outfit she was wearing? I did not. A sleeveless shirt, but still had the cuffs around her wrists. Wow. Fashion I, faux pas. I, I couldn't get away with this look. No. And I don't think you could either. And besides, my breasts are I way too hairy. Better. Anyway, uh, and then Cornette uh, signed Tracy Brooks versus Gail Kim to a match later. Thanks a lot, Jimmy. Basically, Spike is cut down on... They, they want no more man-on-woman violence. So they turn it into an angle on TV, and women-on-women -women violence is apparently okay. But funniest thing here is, is Don West is like, that's Jim Cornette's a good man. It's a good man. We don't need any more of this. <laughs> and I'm just thinking... Wasn't it you that, like, two weeks ago was so irate because somebody stopped man-on-woman violence? Hmm. They had a hell of a 180 here there, Don West. But, uh, yeah, so they did the whole thing, and, and um, what was I going to say? I had another point here. What were you talking about when you were going off? Oh, Eric Young. Why are you a fan of Eric Young? Dude, that uh, that indie show we went to in Lakewood at the casino. Two years ago when he that was a completely guy different guy. rules. 
Listen, is 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 a is a comedy heel. Yeah. Eric Young is unreal. Yeah. As a comedy baby face, it's hit and miss. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's it's bad, and he's just too much of a Eugene right now. Yeah. I mean, he he. I think Eric Young could really be something. Yeah. But he's he's a comedy geek. He's a great worker too, man. Maybe that'll change at the pay per view. It's Rude and Eric Young with Eric's freedom and our freedom, I might add, on the line. And that's Slam Anniversary, and when is that? Oh, it's the I think it's the day after oh, Vegas. It's, it's no, it's uh, Father's Day. Which yeah, is I want to say it's fourteenth, but I'm not hundred percent sure. Well, thank God I've got a calendar here. Slam anniversary is the seventeenth, everybody. Okay. Day after UFC in Belfast. Right. That'll, that'll be a fun uh weekend. Actually you've seen Belfast will be easy. It's noon. So anyway, then we had uh Tom Co. <laughs> he was mad. Yeah. And you know what? There were th- there was this and there was one other segment on the show that literally was on the screen for so little time that I don't even know what happened. Uh huh. This was one of them. <laughs> so Tanae interviewed Daniels and Sting. He wanted to get to the bottom of this. Hold on, hold on. Go back to the Tomco thing. It, he was chasing around Christian. And no, you. That's later. That's that's later. This was just I when he showed Christian up. Christian made an appearance behind Tomco in this segment, didn't he? He may have. I don't remember. And he was wearing the, the glasses, the raper glasses, and hood. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Right, he was so. funny on this show. Yeah. So, Tanae interviewed Daniels and Sting and wanted to get to the bottom of the situation. And Oh, Jesus. Basically, Daniels <laughs> I know was you're going explaining <laughs> the storyline. And five months ago, he lost a title and he wanted advice and Sting gave it to him. And basically, Sting said, you took my advice wrong. And 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 then... And how charismatic is Sting on a, on a promo? Huh? This whole thing is driving <laughs> me crazy. You had you had uh, who was was it Tanae that was interviewing both? I, sorry, all I, all I know I about so. this is I always watch these things and I think where are you? Mm-hmm. They were like in front of a metal door, yeah, it was like a big garage door, and there was a blue light on them, and then slivers of white light, and I'm like, where are you? Are you underground? <laughs> It's like when they interview Abyss or whatever, and he's in a, an atomic, some sort of <laughs> nuclear plant. Yeah, shelter. Yeah. I don't know. Well, they're on the sound stage in uh, Florida. I'm sure there's lots of things Universal can have them do. So anyway, the whole gimmick is is Daniels is is taking the wrong advice from Sting, and it will lead to something. A holy war. So they immediately cut backstage. Letitia's interviewing Gail, and Tracy storms in. They get in a cat fight. That's right. Wow, that sucked. Is all of this stuff really necessary? Absolutely not. And when I ask that, I mean, is it really necessary? No. I, it was funny because I think Tanae called her the uh, the buoyant or something like that. <laughs> Tracy. <laughs> oh, you're never going to be able to bury that woman at sea. Sanjay is now the guru. Sanjay Dutt. He's Gandhi. He, well, yeah, I guess. That's the angle. He's gone. Yeah, I, I, Not I the actual gone. He, but you know what's funny? My wife came in and saw uh, Kevin Nash and goes, Oh, he looks good. <laughs> well. I said, Wow. He said, Yeah, he's kind of got that Sean Connery. You know, you know you're handsome, really... handsome look to him. Sure, yeah. I, well, I don't know why I threw that in, but. I don't know. It's, it... They made me laugh. I, I laughed at this segment. Um. Who's the, who's the black dude? I'm sorry. Uh, Sanjay. Macho. Oh, the yeah. black machismo? Yeah, yeah. What's the... Uh, God, I know Jay this guy. Lethal. Thank you, Jay Lethal. Uh, he, had the, he had the full-on glasses and hat, and uh, they had some exchange at the end where Sanjay was making them all meditate, and and Nash just let out this, hey, like he was meditating. Oh. It's like he was meditating. It was funny. That's dude. how it's done when you meditate. Well, that's the way Kevin Nash does. It. I see. So anyway, then we had uh, news oh, footage of pills or Frank Wycheck. I yeah, know, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right. Somebody was laughing about guy. something. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> like Matt Wycheck is is uh, he's a football guy. Some famous football guy though. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. He's a guy that plays football. Right. So anyway, he's going to have a match with James Storm Clobbing at the pay-per-view. They actually showed the news clips of this, and then later <laughs> they had James Storm in a match where the winner would go to Slammiversary. And I thought, shouldn't you... Already, yeah. Don't no. you already, aren't you already booked? Well, no, I mean, shouldn't you have waited to air the Y check thing? Right. Was, it, was it imperative that it was on this show and not, say, next week's show? Oh, no. So anyway, they had a... 
Wacky skit with Angle, AJ, and Christian. Angle threatened to kill him. Uh-huh. And then AJ and Christian did slapstick so Borash could react in a comical manner. Right. Funny. Uh-huh. Goofy. Hmm. Tracy and Gail. For a woman's match, I thought it was fine. Sure. Better than most Raw matches. And, and uh, Gail is a great little baby face. Tracy was completely competent as a heel. Mm-hmm. And people were into it. Tracy went for something, and Gail turned in a sunset flip for the pin. And then, of course, an angle. The top, the top rope hurricane rod on that scared the daylights out of me. I thought she was going to land on her head. Rude ran out afterwards, and Gail jumped on him. But then Tracy made the save, and and uh, I guess that was it. Sure. I don't know why they had to do that. I guess Tracy needed her heat back. This was imperative that happened on this show. So then we had a segment occurred that went by so fast, I have no idea who was involved. So I'm going to move on. I think that was the uh, Tom Coe and uh, Christian. No, that's later. That's later. I would remember that. This went like three seconds, seriously. It's like they just had to put a three-second segment in. Do you hear that sound now? I heard that. It It sounded like a phone ringing or something. No, it's your fucking chair when you squirm around. Dude, I'm... Oh, it's my chair. Thank you. (laughs) You may all go back now and put that in the Brian was actually right for him, which is every forum. More stuff with the Dudleys and Steiners. Fucking awesome. And again, Steiners hurt, which makes me me very sad. So then we had the Tomko uh, when he ran into Christian. He actually caught him. Yeah, he he said, we're going to do this the hard way or the easy way. And he did. It was a chase and he captured him. Yeah. And he captured him in a... Child's birthday party area, <laughs> and there was a picture on Big Bird sure. in the in the foreground. Well, you know, TNA, <laughs> big fans of of oh of yeah, public they have television. kids parties there all the time. Sure, yeah, Tomko bounces the kids on his knee, and yeah, yeah, they let Angle play with the kids, and oh, don't eat that candy. Can we move on now? Sure. They anyway. There's uh, balloons. I was hating this until Christian started talking, and he basically said, "You were a geek." He used the Jedi mind trick. And I took you, and I made you, I I basically am responsible for your your current job in wrestling. Yeah. Including in this here company. Right. So, right now, it is all about me. Yeah. So, fuck off. And he bought this. Someday it will be your turn. He bought this. He did. He bought it. And and it was fantastic because it, it was, it was, this is why I liked it. It was understandable that Tomko would buy it. This was not just utter <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> he outsmarted the, the big He didn't guy. even outsmart him. He, he, just, he just told it like it was. But, obviously, Christian is, is afraid of Tomko. Sure. But he told it like it was as a way to get this big scary man off his back. This was good stuff. And Big Bird was in the back in a picture. Chris Harris and James Storm had another great match. Yeah. Their feud was supposed to end at the pay-per-view, but that match was so awesome that it has now continued. They got this match here. It started with 19 minutes left on the show. They went through commercial break. This was the longest match on Impact in all of 2007, and perhaps 2006 as well. And it was great. They brawled all over the place. Garbage cans, big dives over the guardrail. Double juice. Double juice. Finish was awesome. Storm got a beer bottle. And he just hucked it <laughs> yeah. at Harris, and it missed. He went for a second one, and as he had his arm up to throw it, Harris speared him right through the wall that holds up the stage, and they were both dead. Mm-hmm. And the referee announced, if you men are not in the ring by 10, it is a, it is a double countout, which it was. And a big angle. Which means both men are out of the Slammiversary match, which means one spot is open, which will undoubtedly go to one Jeff Jarrett. Sure. So... Afterwards, um, where am I here? Uh, there was an angle. Joe Angle ran down. Joe ran down. Which is undoubtedly going to Jeff Jarrett. Uh, Scroll down. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Go. I, I was just reading my rant about um, what, what happened was after the match, I, I was talking about how, this is in the, in the report for the newsletter, how I had been talking about how TNA should concentrate on the good stuff, mm-hmm. and they have a great you have a great show. Right. And this match was a good example. Sure. Seconds after I wrote that, in ran <laughs> AJ. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, first Joe and Angle came out. Right. And then AJ came out, and Angle put him in the ankle lock. I don't know why AJ went after Angle. I don't know. Why was Angle telling AJ he was going to... Do they have a match next week? 
Dude, I've watched this show one time this year. Anyway, I, this this confused me. Angle's like, I'm telling you in advance I'm going to beat you up, and, and they weren't wrestling on this show. No. I don't know if they're wrestling next week. If they were and it was announced, I didn't see it, so it's a shitty was, job announcing was it. That the, is that the next King of the Mountain? No, he's already qualified. I'm sorry. No, they, yeah, they haven't even... The, the, the next King of the Mountain is Christian and a Mystery Man. Right, which will probably be... It'll be Abyss. Sure. But, um, so anyway... Angle put him in the ankle lock, and AJ ran off. And then Cornette was in his office arguing with a ref. And then Christian was in with Tom Coe. And Christian wanted to know who his opponent was next week. And Cornette told him not to worry. It was someone Christian thought was underneath him. And in the middle of all this ranting, my DVR cut out, and I was never so happy. Yeah, you know what? They went a little long because my TiVo cut out as well. Yep. The, um, uh, I mean, it, it was a show where the last five minutes was such bullshit, clusterfucky bullshit mm-hmm. that it hurt the show. And and I just slow down. Yeah, it's, you don't need more time. It's total. Russo Technically, booking. you need less time. It's total Russo booking. Everything's rush, rush, rush. No, I mean, I don't even. I can't even necessarily blame Russo for this because you you miss the real Russo-rific stuff. This is way toned down oh. from his peak, but it is still too fucking fast. I, this, you don't need more time. You need less time. Cut out half of this bullshit. It's not needed. And it's not necessary. Wrestling matches. Not even it's so much wrestling, wrestling matches. No, just wrestling matches are great. They are great. And, <laughs> and it would it would be great if you had a match like Harrison Storm and and uh, in the opener every week. But the the bigger issue is is don't dilute all the good stuff with all this extra shit. It's not needed. Mm-hmm. So anyway, other than that, it was the best impact in forever. Yeah, I, en- I actually enjoyed the show. I hadn't watched it in, in a very long time, and it was it was enjoyable. I didn't want to put a bullet in my head after the thing was over. So we had a thumbs up impact. Now we move on to TNA. Cornette was standing by with Leticia. Always great when total nonstop action starts with talking. Oh, yeah. Always a good start. He told Kurt there was a meeting in his office in 10 minutes. Told Joe and AJ the same thing. Christian walked up, demanded to know who his opponent in the King of the Mountain match was. He said he determined it was Shark Boy. Cornette told him there were bigger fish to fry. Get it? Shark Boy. Fish. Ha ha. Ha ha ha. Ha. Anyway. Basham and Damage It and Scott Steiner and Rick Steiner against Team 3D and VKM. Devon is Jack, Bubba's fat, Steiner's supposed to be heels, Rick was a babyface anyway. And they destroyed BG, Kip James got the hot tag, 8-way, not a DQ, and ended up with Christy spraying something in Kip's eyes, and Basham rolled him up and pinned him. It was all right. Nothing right home about. There, there was a moment there where they, they kept T3D and, and uh, the Steiner separate for a while, and then they, uh, there was all four of them in the ring having a stare down, stare down. Everyone got into it, and things with that feud seemed to be going along just great. And then we had Frank Wycheck James Storm footage from the press conference. Wycheck is a fountain of charisma, this man. Oh, yeah. yeah. And Don said he was working out like crazy to be in shape for the pay-per-view. They changed that match, by the way. It's now a tag match. Was any mention of that made on this show? Nope. Still a singles match, in fact, on this show. Anyway, like anyone cares. Well, yeah. That, I mean, no, no one cares about it anyway, but I just like that... In the angle, they showed the baby face getting a beer spit on him, and then he laid the guy out with a guitar. Didn't he already get his revenge? <laughs> Why am I enticed to watch him wrestle now? I don't know. Then we had a preview for what was up next. It said, and I quote in all caps, Up next, the big meeting in Jim Cornette's office. <laughs> Woo! Don't turn that channel. You Talking. Told, you told him not stop action will be a meeting. No, you Brian, you work alone, so you don't get to take part in meetings. You don't know what, how, what fun and games happen in meetings. Well, I call meetings here with myself. I'm like, meeting in the kitchen in five minutes. Protein shake. Yes, well, it, normal meetings don't last five minutes. It's it's much longer, and much doodling is done in meetings. And as far as I can tell, nothing besides doodling ever actually gets accomplished. Actually, I would tell you about meetings. At the gym, every now and then there will be a coach's meeting. <laughs> I used to go to these. <laughs> We'd, like, all sit around... And, like, nothing would happen. Everyone would be like, the kids aren't allowed to jump off the balcony into the pit. Don't swing your kids towards the glass. Uh, Everybody needs to wear a staff shirt. 
and I just eventually stopped going. Mm-hmm. I just didn't even go anymore. I, mean, I have not gone to a staff <laughs> meeting in as long as I can even remember. And and luckily, I have one class, so I... I <laughs> what, are they going to fire me from my one class? <laughs> you be a hoofy $24 a week. Yeah, so... Anyway, my, my dad is utterly, utterly pointless, these meetings. My dad has suffered through many a miserably long, pointless meeting in his life, and now he's in a position where he has to schedule meetings. So he always schedules them for like 4.30. So the meetings never run long. Everyone gets there, they get what they have to do done, and they get out of there on time and go home. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know. Meetings. Meetings but, are a... a, a, a but it's a selling point, TNA. Up <laughs> next. They are, they are a chore in life. This thing to be avoided and, and postponed and... and and Dawes, and in TNA, it's an enticement. Up next, the big meeting in Jim Cornette's office. In the office. Don't miss out. So then there was the meeting. Cornette yelled at them, signed a six-man. Sting, Rhino, and Tom Coe versus Angle, Joe, and AJ. The former team was not in the Slammiversary match. The latter team was. And if anybody in the former team beat anyone in the latter team, they got their spot in King of the Mountain. Cornette said it was all about the ratings. <laughs> And the look on AJ's face when he said that was so awesome. <laughs> and then all three guys threw a fit, and that was the big meeting that yeah. everyone was supposed to tune in for. These three big badass men, the, the Olympic gold medalist, the Samoan submission machine, and the phenomenal one, they cried like children. They did a video package explaining the King of the Mountain match. and You know, I always... <laughs> <laughs> We've been over this before. Every time they do one of these, we go over it again. Well, no, I... I knew they were doing this King of the Mountain, and, and whenever I hear King of the Mountain, I'm like, God, it's that stupid reverse ladder match. That's all I remember about it, a mm-hmm. stupid reverse ladder match. So then they explained the rules, and I actually got mad again. <laughs> I was like, I was better off when I just thought it was a reverse ladder match. Now I remember there's, like, a, you have to pin there's a, a box, and there's a penalty box, and there's time, and there's innovation. <laughs> I don't fucking want innovation. I just want something simple. Show me two men beating each just other. Just show me ass kicking. Yes. Who wants to see It doesn't have to be two men. Just show me ass kicking. Explain to me. I'm not a hockey fan. Is it? Is it a? What's, what's the big draw in hockey? The fucking fight or the dude sitting in the fucking box? Most it's the fight itself, not the sitting in the box. Hey, wait a second, you mean sitting in the box isn't part of the draw of a hockey game? No. Seriously, come on now. No, in fact, it, it, who it's... the fuck cares about a penalty box? I just want to see people kicking each other's ass. Yes. Hate this fucking match. There was a point on the show where they were King of the Mountain, and, and Mike and they said it's like a ladder match, but more complex. <laughs> Woo! <Woo-hoo>, good. <laughs> Again, he said this was like the meeting, like this is something to. to, to to be looked forward to. Yeah. To be worth paying for. That's what they think. It's like, more complex. Yeah. It, it, this is not just... It, it's not just, just two guys hurting each other. We're going to add some complexities to it. We're, we're going to make it so there are periods where they can't beat on each other because they're, they're, they're In a box. incarcerated. God, this sucks. Then we had Chris Harris cutting a promo about his match at the pay-per-view. I believe... <laughs> well, no. He cut a promo. He, he cut a promo. Uh, there was someone else there. Hector? Hector. Chris, Chris Harris and Hector Guerrero cut a promo. And I was sort of half paying attention. I was there watching the screen. I thought, all right, they have cut a promo. Slammiversary is this Sunday. That's great. And then you asked, what's their match in the pay-per-view? And I thought, you know, I have no idea. Yes. <laughs> they seem, whatever they're doing in the show, I don't know. Yes. But I know that in Chris Harris's corner will be Hector Guerrero. And LAX is on the other side. So I presume Hector Guerrero is going to join the Mexicans. That's, sure. It's, 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 who knows? Who cares? Sting and Rhino. <laughs> you said that with such passion. Who cares? Who does care? Who the fuck could possibly care if Hector Guerrero joins LAX? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> this is big news in the world of wrestling. Hector Guerrero with other Mexicans? <laughs> fuck! <laughs> I hate the show. Sting and Rhino... Versus Angle, Joe, and AJ in a match less exciting than the ping pong battle. Oh, God, yes. Oh, Jesus, yes. Tom Cole was... This is another... This, this is actually something about Teen A that's great. I have to admit this. Tom Cole was laid out backstage, okay? Because it's TNA, they can't just have a guy laying on the ground backstage. Okay? Not good enough. They put him upside down on, like, metal steps with... <laughs> About 74 feet of cable around his neck. <laughs> this man wasn't going nowhere. <laughs> and 
There's nobody there to help him. Just the cameraman filling him like, look, a body. Let's broadcast this on national television. Hope he's breathing. He just laid there alone, upside down, on steps with something around his neck, all contorted. So anyway, they had this match. So the story of this match was there were three men on a team, A.J., Kurt, and Joe, and the three men on this team all hated each other. <laughs> what a new and exciting concept, a team that don't get along. Never seen that before on Impact. And at some point, I don't know if it was during this match or after the promo in Cornette's office, but Don West said, we're going to see the men on this team kill each other, and that's what we want to see. And I thought, no, that's not what I want to see. I want to see two teams of men fight. <laughs> if these men don't like each other, don't put them on the same team. I am sick of that bullshit. Well, that's that's TNA. Oh. Everybody needs to hate each other in TNA, you see. So, anyway, they had the match, and, and who should run out but Chris Daniels. And Chris Daniels jumped on Sting's team. Here's where it got shitty. And then, oh, no, it was shitty long before this, but... Oh, no, it, it sunk to a new depth at this moment. Sting tagged Daniels in. And my question was, why didn't Sting tag Rhino? Why did he... St- but anyway, let's just forget that. Sting decides, hey, the guy to tag here is Chris Daniels. Not Rhino, Chris Daniels. Chris Daniels immediately turns on him and, and beats on him. And now remember the rules. Let me explain the rules one more time. The stipulations. Sting and Rhino were not in the King of the Mountain match. Angle, Joe, and AJ were. So if Sting pinned Angle, Joe, or AJ, or Rhino pinned Angle, Joe, or AJ, they got that person's spot in the King of the Mountain match. So, for example. So this was a must-win situation for Sting and Rhino. Yes. For the other team, they just had to not lose. Uh, and frankly, they could lose as long as one of their teammates getting pinned. Sure, yes. The yes. whole thing was just eat. None of the heels could get pinned. The, that's it. As long as Joe does not get pinned, Joe should be happy. So what happens when Daniels beats up Sting? Well, Angle and Joe get in a fight about who is going to pin Sting. This... If anybody can explain to me why it mattered who pinned Sting, I will give you a billion dollars. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Hang on, i got, I got to think about this. Let me think one more second. I'll get back to you. Why would it matter... Who pins Sting? Well, that's the problem with the billion-dollar offer is that it's absolute nothing. There was nothing on the line. Was it prestige to pin a man after he had been laid out by the fallen angel? <laughs> was it such hatred of angle that you don't did not want to see him pin anyone, even though you wouldn't just kick his ass, let him get pinned, and let Sting get his match, his slot, and your slot would be safe? Each man already said they they already made it clear in the office that they were just angry about the fact that they could lose their spot. They did not. That's the only thing they cared about. I don't want to lose my chance at the title. If Angle pins Sting, Joe's spot at King of the Mountain is, in fact, safe. Yes. Joe did not need to get the pin. Joe didn't need to do anything except not lose. In fact, they made the point earlier in the match when AJ went to tag out. I think it was AJ. Somebody went to tag out, and his partners ran away. Yes. And they knew if they were outside, they could not get pinned. Therefore, they could not lose their King of the Mountain spot. This drove me crazy. I... I hate the show. I hate the show. And I ask again, how could this be the same company that made the great impact of last week? I, how can this be? I don't know. Christian and Abyss. Oh, Abyss is back. <laughs> this show sucked 15 cocks. Abyss made his big return. Unbilled. <laughs> He's a mystery guest after the most... One of the best angles that they've done all year. Well, it should have been, except they cut away after 30 seconds. Well, there was that. But but in, in, in theory, one of the best angles they did all year. And one of the most... Gruesome. One of the most gruesome. One of the, one of the most authentically, physically damaging things I've ever seen a wrestler do. And one of the longest built-up climaxes to an angle. Because they had been teasing Abyss turning babyface for months and, months and months and months and months and months and months and months. And this was the big babyface turn. Mm-hmm. So after all that, after all that, he returned unbilled. Yes. Now, hold on a second. We often talk about how will this sell any buys? And people are like, ah, they're not gonna fucking buys. Okay. If it's if we're not gonna talk about buys, Jim Cornette talked about ratings. 
So not only are they selling no buys with the return of Abyss, they didn't even get any ratings because it was a surprise. It was a secret return. There are three things <laughs> a show could possibly do. It could sell a pay-per-view, it would draw a big rating, or at least it would entertain the people who did watch it. This was a miserable figure on all fronts. It sold no buys. Right. It got no ratings. Right. And it, it sucked. It got no reaction. <laughs> no. So anyway, there's your, your big uh, abyss return. Didn't you get, he lost. Well, that I uh, that sounds worse on paper than it was. He was he was a baby face, that's for sure, and the people cheered for him and that sort of thing. They had a match that was average, and and anyway, Abyss hit a choke slam. Christian kicked out. He does, for those of you wondering, have giant thick scars running right down the middle of his arm tattoos now. So he isn't literally scarred for life now. Yep. All for this. All for this big comeback un- unannounced on on Impact. Christian had a splash, Abyss kicked out, a bunch of shit happened, ref ref this and that. Finally, Abyss hit Christian with a chair for the DQ, then hit the ref with it, and then Christian, laying on his ass, advanced in the King of the Mountain tournament. So Abyss grabbed glass, and then out came members of TNA management, which was actually the funniest thing on the show, because they all just ran, arms by their sides, heads bowed at Abyss's fist, and then fell down like a cartoon. And then uh, AJ and Tomko were out, and then they went to chokeslam Abyss, but Christian said no and got a bat, and then Abyss kicked it out of his hand, and then he cleared the ring, and then that was that. Hell of a comeback. <sighs> yeah. Mm-hmm. This show gets a <laughs> thumbs down. You know, when we, started, when we started recording this show tonight, all I could remember was the end of the tag match in ECW, and I'm thinking, wow... ECW is way worse than Impact. In hindsight, that's not true. That is terribly untrue. I apologize to ECW. You sucked five cocks. Impact sucked at least 19. There needs to be the, 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 a uh, new writing crew. If for no other reason than we get the same old shit on every show. A bunch of meetings... A bunch of guys that don't like each other. Shit that does not make you want to pay for a pay-per-view. Or unannounced shit that doesn't even pop a rating. The the match that goes one minute, and then there's a three-minute commercial break, and then it ends in the following minute. ECW is an hour. When's the last time there was ever a commercial in the middle of a match on ECW if the match did not go 20 minutes? That rarely happens. Has there ever been I'm a five-minute match? In fact, it's almost a year, right? Has there ever been a five-minute match on ECW where uh, it went one minute, and I, then it was a commercial, and then it came back for the last minute? I strongly suspect the answer is no. Why? Why must? Why can never? Why can a match never just end? Then the combatants go to the back, and it's over. Why does three thousand people have to run in at the end of every single match, no matter who wins or loses? Every match needs to be a backdrop for an angle in TNA. That's the whole thing, and the angles are all ineffective. So what's the point? Just have some fucking good wrestling or something. Do something. This show is useless. Useless. This show is no. This show is a detriment. This show is beyond useless. It actually makes me not want to watch the pay per view. Here's a pay per view this Sunday, by the way. Do any of you care? Raise your hand. I hear utter silence. Even the dog stopped barking. Nobody gives a shit about this show. And what a surprise if you actually watch Impact. Thankfully, you just watched TNA, so hopefully you can't forget the majority of it. This was the five-year anniversary show. They have been around for five years. And I don't know what that means. It means they've lost a lot of money. <laughs> they've lost a sh- tremendous amount of money. They have not gone out of business. They have put on some of the best shows ever. They put on some of the worst shows ever. It's like a... I'm trying to think of how to describe what TNA is. It's a promotion with a money mark. <laughs> okay, then. It's, it's a... It's a, uh, it's a guy who... 
went bankrupt and lost his job, and then a rich relative died and left him a windfall. And he has been uh, living on it now for five years. You know, and, I, I'm telling folks that he is, in fact, a success. Yeah, a better example, a guy who lost a job, went bankrupt, found a, 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 an old, rich widow and married her. And she has been taking care of him for five years. Yep, yep. And he's been telling people he's a success. But at any time, the widow may come to her senses and pull the plug. She could divorce him at any time. That's right. And she signed a prenup, so he would be fucked. Yes, that's the key here. That is the story of TNA, and it opened up with a bunch of clips from the past. And, uh, wow. Yeah. They, there, was, there was flying Elvises. There was midgets. There was cat fights between forgotten women. There were caves dancing. Then it went to the, 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 the video touring Tennessee, and there was a video flying over a river and... A trailer park, and a car yard, and a general store, and it just like the biggest middle of nowhere, small town, nothing happening, Hicksville, minor league promotion you could possibly imagine. And I was sad that the show took place in the municipal auditorium because I was hoping that it would take place in the old Nashville fairgrounds, that dump. <laughs> it busted out the old set. But sadly it didn't. They they aired it from the auditorium, and, and as I said... As I said, the first two matches of the show were great, and there was some other very good stuff on the show, and there was also some stuff that was just wasn't that great. There was nothing on the show horrible, I don't think, but there there were some things that were very maddening, and there were there were things that when you when you think about why has TNA still not turned a profit even with the rich widow? It's almost like a, a rich widow married the guy. And he started all these little side businesses, and he still can't get any of them to make any money. Yeah. And you're like, it's been five years. You haven't figured something out yet? Well, there were many, many reasons. There are many points on the show where it was where it was clear why that was. The, what was I going to say? The crowd was awesome. The crowd was great. The building looked cool. The building looked fine. Okay, I don't know yeah, if I can yeah. go as far it as It looked cooler things. than the impact zone. Yes. It was, it was bigger. There was, the, the crowd was height. I was... It, was, it it looked cool, and the crowd was live all night long. I was doing Observer Live. It was 5.05 p.m., and Dave started talking about the show, and it suddenly hit me, I forgot to order. You forgot there was a TNA pay-per-view today. I didn't so much forget. Well, I, I knew there was a pay-per-view, but, but I cared so little that it slipped my mind that I should order it. And so we ended up having to order the 8 o'clock show and watch it with no benefit of fast-forward, which was a bitch, let me tell you. But the fact that I completely forgot about ordering the five-year anniversary of TNA suggests a low buy rate. <laughs> and it's, It is a small sample size, but it's going to be a powerful one. My sample size has is, is normally been a hell of a drop. My uh, sample size has normally been a, a pretty good indicator of, of final numbers, and I can tell you that this probably did 25,000 buys. Well, you may be correct there. I know I'm going out on a limb, but uh, there you go. LAX faced Rhino and Senshi. This was an awesome opener. Homicide and and uh, Hernandez were the LAX members, and they beat the shit out of Senshi. Hernandez threw him all over the place. He's a very small man. Thrown all over, left and right, and finally Rhino made the hot tag, and it was a four-way. Senshi wiped out Hernandez, and then Hector Guerrero ended up snapping Homicide's neck over the top rope. Rhino gored him for the pin, and that was awesome. This was, in fact, great stuff. We, we knew LAX was a good team, and Rhino and Senshi, as it turns out, is also a good team. and They're obviously good by themselves, but, you know... Hernandez is always awesome when he's a little guy to throw around, and, and Loki is a very little guy. This, this, that pairing worked out fine, and of course we all know Loki and Homicide were great together, and Rhino was Rhino was Rhino, and that's good. And the ending it, it sounded a little convoluted, but it, it worked out fine because Conan threw in the the the, the blackjack, whatever that is, and, and Homicide went to use it, but Hector Guerrero uh, took it away and snapped his neck out. So the bad guys tried to cheat, but they were foiled and they were out cheated by the good guys, and. Uh, the heroes won, all was right in the world, and things were off to a great start. 
psychology of this match was perfect, and it was a big thumbs up. So, off to a good start. Hooray for all of these men. We had a wacky skit with Borash, Eric Young, Tracy's Breasts, Gail Kim, and basically Tracy tried to seduce Eric so that he would lose his match to Robert Roode via forfeit and thus be fired, and Gail got his mind off of that by kissing him. So now he's the big, uh, I don't know what he is, the big sex symbol in TNA or something like that. But We had Jay Lethal and Chris Saban for the X title. Nash came out to watch and do commentary. Then they gave an entrance to Sanjay Dutt. He got a full entrance. He came down to the ring. And the match started, and, and Saban and Lethal are doing spots. And I sat there, and I thought, where the fuck did Sanjay Dutt go? And as it turns out, he wasn't in the match. He wasn't at ringside. He wasn't doing commentary. Unless I missed something, he just came out for the sake of coming out. He came out, he scattered rose petals for, for lethal. I thought he was at ringside, and I thought he would interfere with the finish. But no, he disappeared and was never seen again. Yeah, I have no idea. I have no earthly idea. They just wanted to get him on television. <laughs> this is the worst I- example of that ever. So these two guys had a, another great match. A million near falls, a, a million high spots, and it was all good stuff, and... And finally, Lethal hit the flying elbow, supposedly. It actually was like a high cross off the top rope to a downed opponent. And got the pin, won the title. He's a new ex-champion, 22 years old. And afterwards, Nash hit the ring, gave Lethal a big hug, and, and everybody seemed happy. And at that point, I thought, if every pay-per-view over the last five years was full of matches, like the two matches that I just saw, they would be making money right now. Instead, they're not. Darn. The only problem I had with this was lethal a couple times. He, the heat was on him, and he's taking move after move after move, and then he would make one cutoff, and suddenly, bang, he's fine. That being said, aside from that, everything was great, as the Iron Sheik once made famous. and They were flying around and working a million miles an hour. The crowd loves black machismo. They, they love to see him do his, his macho man. They love to see him win, and... and because they did not do a million near falls and numb the crowd out, they, they hit one big move, made one big cover, and that was it, and everyone was happy. And, and again, all was right with the world. He's a much better worker as Randy Savage than Jay Lethal. That is true. Everyone should just emulate somebody. Maybe that would make this a better business. That's how it used to work. You used to be able to watch a guy and go, oh, his favorite wrestler was so-and-so growing up. Now you watch him and you're like, his favorite wrestler was himself in the backyard. His favorite wrestler was Raw versus SmackDown for PlayStation 2. That's bad. James Storm cut a promo running down Frank Wycheck. James Storm is a great promo. That was, in fact, awesome. Running down every athlete in the world ever. Said you better kiss your wife and your kids goodbye. Said he was going to give him a concussion, the last concussion he'd ever have. And then after he was done, Jackie made fun of Letitia's fake breasts saying they were lopsided. As, as someone on our board once noted. I had heard that, <laughs> that they were lopsided. That was a shoot. James Storm and Ron Killings versus Frank Wycheck and Jerry Lynn. They had a bunch of Tennessee Titans in the crowd. and Ron Simmons was out for months, knee surgery. Killings. Which, uh, what did he say? Wrong, wrong, Ron. He said Ron Simmons. Ron Simmons was out with knee surgery. Never cracked me. <laughs> Ron Killings is out for uh, months with Ron Simmons. They both had knee surgery. And in WWE, Ron Simmons' knee surgery was paid for. In TNA, Ron Killings, they loaned him the money, and he has to pay it back. That sucks. Much like Conan with his fake hip. So he's gone all this time. He left as a baby face. He returns on the show to no fanfare. He got less of a of an entrance than Sanjay Dutt, who was not even in a fucking match. And he came back as a heel for no good reason. He's just mean. So they had a match, and, and White checked. He's not LT. Well, he, he, was, he was an amateur. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. He botched a, a couple spots early, but, but once, once he sort of got going, he was perfectly acceptable. Not good by any stretch of the imagination, but not horrible. He may, in fact, have been better than you in many matches. Sure. Oh, he's certainly better than me at my worst. Yes. And 
you know, they did a they did a fine job making him look all right. He threw some drop kicks. Well, I, I would question. Well, he, he's the, he was the biggest guy in the match, and he's a football player. Yet every time they did a tackle spot, Storm knocked him down. And yet here's the biggest guy in the match doing these drop kicks, and he's doing them. They were not particularly good. I would have switched those two spots. I would have had him hit shoulder tackles, knock the other guys down, and then James Storm and Ron Kinlins could drop kick him and he would go down. Yeah, but you have to understand how res- wrestlers work. I mean, they probably saw this big fat guy do a drop kick that wasn't horrible and were like, you've got to do that in the match. Oh, there is that. I've... They just want to throw shoulder. It's not like he was doing the pounce and was he was getting pounced left and right. No. He just taking a tackle, which if you do a tackle spot right... Everybody who takes a tackle should take a bump because your head's down till the guy runs into you. You're not running at each other like bulls and right. one guy falls down. You're taken you're you're taken off guard by a man giving you a tackle. Anyway, the point was he looked fine and the finish saw a bunch of wackiness, all sorts of craziness and ended up with storm hitting killings and with a beer bottle on accident. And then Wycheck grabbed Storm and hit him with a pile driver for the pin. Yes. A cradle pile driver, in fact. Well, it wasn't supposed to be. Ah. But, uh, yes, Storm, um, I'm sorry, yes, Storm got pinned by a football player with a pile driver. This was, in fact, wrong. The fans loved it. I think that if you're going to pin a wrestler with a pile driver, don't pin the fucking guy that used the bottle on his partner. Pin the guy that got hit with the fucking bottle. That way, he's got an out. As it was, you took James Storm, who had just finished an awesome series of matches with Chris Harris, and you beat him clean with a guy who'd been in the ring one time in his entire life and wasn't a wrestler. That's bad news. The match was fine. I guess. You could say the same thing about LT and Bam Bam. I realized that was a much higher profile deal. It was a much higher profile deal, and it was a, a WrestleMania main event, and and they hit each other really hard. Yeah, that was, that, that was in fact better than this. But, but th- this was by no means a disaster. <laughs> was that a Vince moment? <laughs> it was. You, oh, sorry. You, you, you concluded as if to... There's a certain way where, where you speak where you're indicating don't say anything because there's more to come. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I, I thought I had weaned that out of my system. It's You've improved. I don't do it as often. That was our first one in a while. Perhaps you should listen back to these shows, and, and you'd probably listen to yourself and, and wait for more to come out of your own mouth. <laughs> I mean, that's entirely possible. And you'd be yelling at yourself. Alex Shelley and Bob Backlund. Bob Backlund's my hero. He is, I think he's 58. They said 57. Anyway, he's old. And he had a robe and a towel and shorts and knee pads, and shooter boots. And he came out and he moved better than almost the entire roster. He was in better shape naturally than pretty much anyone you'll see at 57 or 58 years old. He did all of his old spots, including uh, Shelly going for the short arm scissors, and he, he uh, yes. power cleaned him onto his shoulders or deadlifted him onto his shoulders, and he did his atomic ass drop. And finish saw uh, Backlund do a rolling reverse cradle and a bridge for the pin. And then afterwards, Saban tried to attack him, but Backlund beat him up and put Shelly in the crossface chicken wing. And Nash came down and Jerry Lynn came down. I have no idea why. But the point was Nash booted Lynn, and then all the bad guys beat on Backlund, and, and Jay Lethal ran down to clean the ring, and he didn't know whose side who was on, and, and that was that. And my idea is... They need to do another Nash Backlund match because they keep mentioning that Nash beat him in eight seconds or nine seconds or whatever it was. So they need to build up to the rematch, and then Backlund needs to beat him in like six seconds and and redeem himself for that horrible loss many years ago. That would be fine. When they did, when, when Shelley hit the hip toss and then he applied a short arm scissors, I thought, good God, they're going to try and do that spot. And I thought, there's no way they're going to be able to pull it, pull it off. And and, and Backlund rolled backwards once, and they, they, they kind of teased it. Backlund rolled backwards, he got in position, and then went for a pin, and then Shelly rolled him back over, and they were back in the short arm scissors again. And I thought, they, they thought better of it. And then Backlund rolled back to his feet, and he braced himself, and I thought, here they go, I hope this works. And Backlund lifted him like a child. <laughs> Not for one second did I doubt Bob Backlund. I was a fool. You he were was, a fool. It, 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 not only did he pull this off, he, he, he could have had Sanjay Dutt on his other arm and gotten them both up in the air. 
He had no difficulty with this whatsoever, and he calmly walked him over to the top rope and sat him down on the turnbuckle. This, that was mighty. This this man, he when he does that stair stepping gimmick at TNA for the tapings, he does it through the whole tapings. Three like, hours. Like three hours. Yes. They tell him, Bob, it's fake. We'll 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 film you and then we'll we'll film you later and we'll just pretend. And he's like, No, I'm going to do it the whole time. This guy's a fucking monster. He is a a freak like few others. He would kick all of our asses. He would kick Alex Shelley's ass, that's for sure. I had no problem with him pinning Alex Shelley. No. I'd have no problem with him pinning uh, Chris Saban. I would have no problem with him pinning most of the guys on this roster, including VKM, who were in the next match. They faced the Bashams. This was an impact moment. It was a backdrop for an angle. They did a quick match, and then after uh, Kip pinned somebody, I think it was uh, Damajo with a... Small package. Out came Christy and Kip chased her to the back. Lance Hoyt grabbed her and was about to drag her backstage. And Kip said, no, let's bring her to the ring for a gang fucking. They were going to rape her. Yeah. And and so they brought her to the ring. And, and as they were about to do the deed, Hoyt booted Kip James in the face. And then the Bashams ran in. And all three bad guys beat up VKM. And, and Christy and Hoyt pretty much had sex in the middle of the ring. So they're now a couple. And it is now Hoyt, Christy, and the Bashams as a heel crew. That's going to sell some tickets. Yeah. Maybe. I can think of worse games to have than Christy Hemi's boyfriend. Or worse fates in life. But the, as you noted, this was a complete impact segment. It was a, a very short match. And the Bashams got the heat in one move. Beat him up. They beat up Road Dog for a while. He made the hot tag. Kept James the usual thing. There's nothing else to say about, about the match itself, so we talk about the angle, and you pretty much summed up everything. It is the new heel unit of Hemi, Basham, Damaja, and Hoyt. Enjoy. Some real winners. I was going to keep fixing my glasses and hoping you'd just keep talking, but I knew. I didn't realize you were a hopeless. I actually wasn't even looking at you. I didn't realize you were fixing your glasses until I stopped. <laughs> and my head was still bowed. <laughs> it's like, hey, he's not even looking at the mic. Some, mm. Someday I should just like lose my voice, and the show will be in your hands. Just let you. Do you want everyone to quit? Why don't you talk about Cornette? What happened here? This... <laughs> I can't talk about Cornette. Cornette and Rick Steiner. Okay, there was a segment here where the Cornette was. They talked about uh, Scott Steiner's injury in Puerto Rico. They mentioned it was a throat injury. That's all they, really all they said about it. But uh, Cornette was explaining to Steiner that he could not let him fight Team 3D by himself. Therefore, he was going to have to forfeit. And Steiner said, no, it's okay. I have a partner. And Cornette said, who do you have? And Rick Steiner whispered into Jim Cornette's ear. And Cornette was very excited. And he asked, he's here? He's in the building? Okay, you've got a match. So Steiner left, and he was happy. And Letizia asked Cornette who the partner was. And Cornette said, if he Your wanted... boobs are uneven. Oh, I thought you were talking about me. No, that's <laughs> what he said to Letizia. No. <laughs> Uh, oh, really? <laughs> but regardless, he he did not tell her either. So I immediately turned to Brian and said, "It's going to be animal." Robert Roode and Eric Young in a freedom match, where if Eric won, he got freedom, basically. <laughs> yes. And if Roode won, Cornette said he could do anything he wanted with Eric Young, including burning him with fire. That was that was what he said in the promo. Yes, he did. They did not remind us of that step here. So they had a match, and it was a good match. Robert Root is seriously one of my favorite wrestlers. And Eric Young showed a lot more than he has in like the last two years in this match. Topes and, and stuff like that. He was actually allowed to wrestle for, for once yeah, and not be thing. Eugene. And anyway, the point was, it, it uh, actually there was this one spot where Tracy tried to interfere and and Eric hoisted her up and sent her crotch first in a Robert Root who ended up on top of her. So, basically, Eric had both of them in FU position, and then he gave him the move. That was insane. That was nuts. That, this is not John Cena doing it to lead an edge. This is X-Division guy Eric Young doing it to the much larger Robert Roode, and also Tracy. Who is much larger than Lita. Yes. And so, anyway, he just does this awesome move, and, and this is where I began to hate this show. He does this awesome move, and, and the ref drops down the count, and the director cuts to the fans, cheering. And I presume Robert Roode kicked out. I don't know for sure. Because the director decided that was not an important thing to to film. The actual near fall right there after that awesome move. So then Roode ended up waffling Eric with a chair shot for the pin. So 
grabbed the mic and said, Eric, you're fired, blah, blah, blah. Cornette came out and said, no, I warned you I was going to keep an eye on this match in case of hijinks. Hijinks have, in fact, ensued, and therefore this match is being restarted. Gail Kim ran out and chased Tracy away, and then Rude uh, basically tried to pick up Young, who was dead, and Young rolled him up for the pin, probably in about a minute 30, which is how long all restarts last. And Rude was awesome. Eric was great. And so the storyline has been going on for a thousand years. It may be actually a thousand years. It's certainly been months. Eric Young is, you know, he had a whole thing with Tracy. He was a slave. He was abused. He tried to uh, get his freedom. Month after month after month, they've done this stupid storyline, most of which makes no sense, but they still push it as a, as a main event level, seemingly a main event level storyline. And So after all this time on the five-year anniversary, Eric Young finally beats Robert Roode and wins his freedom. And as the Lord in heaven is my witness, within five seconds of him getting the pin... They cut backstage to an interview with the Dudleys. This is how it's supposed to work, TNA. When the match ends, that is when you show the fans going nuts. When the match is going on, you show the match. When the match is over, then you show the fans. You show them reacting. You give everyone, you give the fans in the building, you give the fans at home, you give the wrestlers, you give everyone time for the moment to sink in. That's all. This made me so mad. They did this with the Harris Storm match, which was so awesome. It and is. again, within five seconds, they decided now is the time to immediately cut away to talking. Why the fuck would you do that? They, they cut away from everything. They cut away from the best getting killed. They, they, if there's no action going on on the screen. You want to know why? You want to know why no one buys these fucking shows and why TNA still hasn't made money after five years? Because nothing is important in TNA. Yeah. Nobody gives a shit about anything. They run all these TV shows, they do all these angles, and nobody gives a shit about any of them. Why? Because none of them mean anything. Why do none of them mean anything? Because there's never a reason to care. There's never any time given to anything to make you care about it. After all these... I hated this fucking storyline. I hated it. But the point is, after... All these months and all this time, you finally conclude this storyline, and then it's over. Like that. Five seconds they cut away. Like, it was like all this time you invested, you're a fool, because it means nothing to us. We don't care. It was a, a slap in the face of the fans who act. To but, us, it's more important to listen to the Dudleys talk than, than to actually, uh, th- this means nothing. And the match is over. Let's move on. Why? I don't know. But between that and the, and the cutaway for the, the, the crowd shot during the near fall. Oh, that, yes. Yeah, that was the, that was the worst of TNA. The, the director needs to be fired. No, I, I, I hate saying that anybody needs to lose their job. I was saying he needs to be kicked in the balls and then fired. This man needs to be fired for seriously the good of TNA. Do it. I mean, uh, quit. If you're listening to this right now and you're the director of TNA, quit. Because Just you suck. do it for the good of the business. Don't be selfish. Don't think about just yourself and your family. Think about all these other people and their families. Just quit for the good of the business because you suck. And you're hurting the product horribly. God, this was so fucking stupid. And you do it all the time. This is not a one-time deal. No, every show we complain about some stupid fucking thing. Why would you cut to a crowd shot in the middle of a near fall? A hot near fall. Why would you do that? Idiots. Dudley's cut a stupid promo. Then we had Team 3D versus Animal and Rick Steiner for the tag titles. And, uh... I was not alone in predicting Animal. There were chances for his name before he came out. Yeah, they had a match, and, and uh... It was a star and a half, maybe. It was, it was there. Uh, it was not as bad as Animal versus Chris Benoit, which was horrendous. He fell down, I believe, on his first spot. Did some no-selling spots with Bubba, which was high comedy. And, anyway, it broke into a four-way... The good guy set up for the Doomsday device, which, of course, was not going to happen. And then out of nowhere, Team 3D pinned Rick. Yes, Rick Steiner. Not Animal. No. They pinned Rick. The guy who, in theory, they will be fitting with again in a few months when his brother gets better. The storyline is the Steiners versus Team 3D, and Scott wasn't around, so they got a replacement. So who did they pin? The real guy. Not the replacement. Yes. 
This made no sense to me. No, they had they wanted Team Peter to win. They had two options for who they could pin. The guy who will be here next month and the guy who won't. They pin the guy who will. All I can think is that, that Team 3D, who I guess are supposed to be baby faces, yeah, good are one. going to brag that they beat the Steiners, and the Steiners can say, no, you didn't. You beat a fake Steiners, even though you pinned a Steiner. Even though they could still say they beat the Steiners. <laughs> If they didn't pin Rick. Wouldn't they want to say they beat the Steiners and the Road Warriors? This was just dumb. Yeah. And and, and, and Rick and Animal were far and away the baby faces. Oh, yeah. No. He, he, to the point where the Dudleys had to acknowledge it. When, when Animal came out, Devon began to mark out. Yes, he did. He was screaming and running back and forth like a child. And when the fans had the LOD, the Team 3D was chanting right along with them. I wrote I wrote Animal and Devon Dudley. And it took me like five minutes to realize, what the fuck am I even doing here? It's the Dudleys. Animal, or, or Devon was so excited. I thought I for sure Animal was the partner. I didn't even have a, <laughs> I didn't even have a doubt in my mind that that was the actual team. And I tr- it turned out he was just marking out. He was just marking out. Good for him. Sting and Chris Daniels had a fine match. Yes, they did. Two and three quarters, probably. It was some uh, good stuff. Nothing off the charts or anything. Sting stinged up. Near falls and such, and then Sting blocked the last right, sent the Scorpion Death Drop, clean pin. Good match. This was good. This is one of the very rare matches where you think, hey, they could have gone longer. Yeah. But as it was, it was fine. It was very basic, very simple. As you noticed, Sting, uh, Daniel said he Stinger splash, and then it mocked Sting, and then that caused Sting to feel no pain. <laughs> Sting did a, a fine job of no-selling Daniel's offense, and then they would have finished, as you described, and... This is fine, and I, I assume it's going to continue in some way starting the next Impact, which is fine. Then we had Abyss and Tomko in a no-DQ match. It was not fine. I think people would either love this match or hate it. And, I don't know. I, I think you hated it far more than I did. I didn't hate the match itself as much as I hated the way it was put together. Well, they... Um, they're, well, yeah, sort of. I mean, I realize... I do realize that Tomko beat Joe... And <laughs> thus he's a major star. Abyss should have killed this man in two minutes. Well, he didn't. He did not. They had a battle. It was no DQ. First they fought in the ring. Then they fought outside the ring. Then Abyss got tax and was immediately get, uh, put into them with a uh, a tree slam. Of course he kicked out. So uh, the tax are now like uh, the first spot in a hardcore match, and it goes up from there. Then his second bag had glass, broken glass in it. And Tomko avoided it. They fought outside, and we got the barbed wire bat, which Tomko began beating Abyss with. So now we've had tax, glass, and a bat. There was more to come. They were brawling with this bat. They brawled outside. They brawled up the ramp. And then uh, they started climbing something high. It was one of those moments where, why were they climbing? No one knows. They just saw something, and they thought, huh. I cannot help but climb this. So they climbed this big scaffold and ended up with, with Abyss knocking him off, and, and Tomko fell pretty much onto a a, uh, a jumpoline, one of those big inflatable castles at the fair. He landed in that, and then Abyss jumped off onto him, and it looked like he slipped and, and fell off onto him, but it didn't matter. So this, of course, was not the finish, no. fall, falling from a great height onto uh, something. They crawled out. They crawled back to the ring. And uh, Abyss ended up hitting a black hole slam into the glass and got the pin. I think it was it was probably plastic. I don't think it was real glass. They, they didn't show a, a close-up of Tom goes back and there was glass sticking to it, and yet no blood. Yes. I, I would plastic or sugar glass, one of the two. It was it was uh, plastic. You can't land in sugar glass and not have it break. That's the point of sugar glass. You go through it. It's plastic. So uh, he lands in this glass, this supposed glass. He gets pinned. And they immediately cut away. They did not even stay on this long enough for Tomko to turn over and show the glass in his back, or to show him lying there and writhing in the glass, or to show Abyss's big celebration. By the way, they said this was Abyss's return. I guess forgetting that he returned on Thursday, or Friday, or whatever day Impact's on. And, uh, yeah, again, an immediate cutaway. All of that for nothing. It was not in- it, it was every Abyss hardcore match you've seen for a while. I, I, the biggest problem I had with this was it was, it was Tomko is is not the guy Abyss needs to be fighting with for 20 minutes, and he did. He should have killed him in two. But 
Beyond that was also it was every by the numbers Abyss Hardcore match. And now we'll get the tax. Oh no, I've gone into the tax. Didn't see that one coming. So then in, in, he he's he gets put in the tax, kicks out of the pin, then he cuts the Tomko off. Now he has still not used the tax. When he got the tax, in theory he had a reason, he had a plan. Now he's abandoned that. Now, now I will go get the glass. And it didn't help that when, when he went for the for the tax, they were like, here he is, he's got the glass. Abyss has the glass, and he pours out tax. So when he goes to the tax, they're like, this is the glass, yes. So that took all the, all the dramatics out of it. And then they went to the back, they climbed up the high thing. There was clearly just a giant shape in front of the stage, a, 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 about eight feet tall, maybe 12 feet wide. It was just a big black shape. It seriously looked like if you took 500 cardboard boxes and put a black tarp over them. <laughs> well, it's funny you should mention that, Brian, because <laughs> when they took the bump through the thing, they yanked the tarp off, exposing... 500 cardboard boxes. <laughs> a surprise. Yes. It, it's just a, so hokey. And and, that, and and then the giant fall off the thing wasn't the finish. Just, well, it, they fell in the cardboard boxes. Of course it was. <laughs> just so stupid. So, yes, I, I hated this. It's not insult someone's intelligence by having two men fall into boxes and have that be the end. It's quite possible that I hated this more than anyone else did. But I did, in fact, hate this. <laughs> it was pretty bad. And then we had uh, another God, a business comeback sucks. Ankle Joe meeting. This was here's here's the way you got to look at it though. Just imagine that that Tom calls Terry Funk or Mick Foley. You got to pretend because that's what they believe. He's like a star to them. He's not Christian's lackey in WWE. He's like a top star that pinned Samoa Joe. That's what you have to imagine. Okay, take it back. The director is not the problem. Well, there are many problems. It's the biggest problem. Then we had a real downer. Jeff Jarrett spoke of his wife and what she meant to him and to TNA all these years, and he could not he could not uh, control himself throughout this entire interview. And he was not the only one. It was a very heartbreaking interview, and it was one of those interviews where I don't think Jeff Jarrett can ever be booed as a heel again. I just don't even think it's possible. Yeah. I mean, it, it would be possible if he goes out there and everyone goes, "Boo, you're a heel." But those the the period where he was a champion in TNA for like four years, something like that, and and everybody hated him, and and it was a passionate hatred where they were like, "I hope Jeff Jarrett goes away and never comes back. I I I, I never want to see him again." Blah blah blah. I don't think anybody can ever. Actually, think that about Jeff Jarrett again after seeing this interview, and and uh, yeah, it was something it was, else. It was very hard to watch. It's it's very hard to hate TNA when you watch this, and and uh, but I will say that it, as mentioned many times, I've never, I never, I don't hate everybody in TNA except maybe the director, but that's a different story. Give him the balls. But I mean, everybody. I mean, I'm sure that they're all wonderful people, and they're all hard workers. They're hardworking people who love wrestling and want to work and succeed in that. That's right. But unfortunately, it's it's a situation where this is a business, and 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 there aren't enough people in TNA who look at this as a business and realize that sometimes dudes got to be fired, sometimes dudes got to be replaced. Sometimes, sometimes dudes can't be on every show. Sometimes things need to be done to to make a business profitable. Sometimes dudes need to look bad to make other dudes look good. And and that's there are many many problems with TNA, but the problems have never been. Boy, all the wrestlers in TNA are no good. Boy, all the wrestlers in TNA are horrible. It's always boy, these guys have to do some stupid shit. Boy. It sure is dumb that an entire show is built around a match that nobody is going to buy or no one's going to care about. Or Eric Young. Why is a comedy figure given as much importance as your main eventers? Why, why, well, there's a million questions, but it's never been about the the actual individuals involved. I'm sure Dixie Carter's a, a wonderful woman. She just has no clue about wrestling. This was, as, it, as we stated about nine times now, tough to watch. When they cut back to the building, fans were legit crying their eyes out. And they, they kind of had to do it. They had to, they had to, and now that it's over, they had kind of had to tell people what was going on with Jeff's life. They had to explain why he was not in the King of the Mountain match here in his hometown in the Slammiversary show. It, it, but boy, it was a downer for the show. 
I had no problem with it. I was when 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 they first mentioned when there was that moment a few months back or, or a month or so back or whatever where Don West made a comment about Jeff Jarrett and his his personal life and his wife, and I thought, uh, uh-uh, uh, this would this will be bad if you start turning this into a storyline. Then all of a sudden, if she passes away, like. A death is is an angle now, and I thought that's horrible. Now, this this was just like, you know, anybody who who uh, is in Jeff Jarrett's position, where where their wife, after a ten year battle with cancer, passed away. To me, they get a, a buy for any sort of behavior over like the next foreseeable future. Hard to argue with that because. I, you know, everybody, what the hell, who am I to judge what this guy's going to do after his wife passes away? He he decided, well, you know, I'm going to uh, tell the story, and he told the story, and that's, uh, not for one second did I not uh, believe that Jeff Jarrett was a, a million percent sincere. And so, you know, from that perspective, I can't uh, fault him for anything that he did. And I guess the, I think what he wanted to do was just say, you know, she she encouraged me when I uh, to keep this thing alive for five years or whatever. And uh, right now, the worst place for me is the ring. Yeah. Which I thought was sort of an odd statement, but uh, again, I I don't know what people are thinking. But so anyway, that's when they announced that that Chris Harris was going to be his replacement, which got a a big pop. And I don't know, he was he was very popular. And when they first broke up AMW, everybody was like, well, Chris Harris is going to be the star, and, and, and James Storm is going to be Marty Jannetty. And I was very sad when I heard that, because I thought, you know, James Storm is great. He often is. He's really great. And God bless Chris Harris, but he doesn't have the charisma. I mean, he's bigger. I think that's the whole deal. He's, he's bigger. He's huge. Uh, James Storm has at times struggled with weight. He has. And, uh, and you know, I, uh, it was pretty obvious they were going to choose Chris Harris as, as the guy, and, and that made me sad. But he did fine here. He didn't he didn't really stick out as, as, as like, a future, boy, this guy should be world champion someday, and he's going to carry the whole company on his back. But, you know, he, he did what he could, and it was the king of the mountain match, which is that oh, fucking bullshit match. It's a reverse battle royal that involves... A penalty box, and and you have to pin a guy to get a right to get a belt and climb a ladder and hang it and win. And the problem was the announcers spent so much time trying to keep track of who was eligible, who was not eligible, who was in the cage or the penalty box, who was not in the penalty box, who was trying to climb and, and, and this and that that... It, it very much took away from the match. And, and I thought, I'm watching this on TV, and the announcers are having to explain it to me over and over and over again. What about all the poor people in the crowd that can't hear the announcers? I know it's it's their pet match. I know it's 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 their little toy. I know it's their their own creation. It needs to be scrapped forever. So anyway, they did this match, and, and it was... I, I lost all, all, all patience and, and, and trying to follow the storyline of the match... There was about two or three pinfalls in, so two guys were eligible and one guy was in the box. And then they did a ref bump. Yes. So now, beyond trying to keep track of who actually had pins and, and who had submissions, now we had a track of who had done pins but they did not count. Yes. And who made submissions that did not count. And as it turns out, Joe locked Angle in a, in, in, in a, in a chokehold and actually choked him into unconsciousness. But the ref was out. And so this did not count, and Joe, I don't think, ever actually became technically eligible. Joe was never eligible. Angle did tap, and I don't know why. I mean, he, he, okay, the point is, everybody, that AJ, Chris Harris, Joe, Christian, and Kurt were in the match. Angle won. He's the TNA champion. And the idea was, well, you know, Joe tapped him, but there was no ref, so Joe should get the first title shot or whatever. But to me... Why couldn't he just tap him with a ref? Why the fuck couldn't he just tap him with a ref? Why couldn't he tap him and be eligible? How Angle does that... tapped, it would have made no difference whatsoever no, in your, the match. Your long-term plan would, would be the same. This match would have been better. Would have, it's less things for us to keep track of. It would have made more sense. But no, 
It wouldn't be a TNA main event without a ref bump. They had a ref bump in this match for literally no good reason. And like I said, Angle won, and and the big rumor earlier in the day was that Joe was going to get it. I don't know if that got changed. I don't know if the idea was, let's go back to our original plan from like a year ago, which was Joe and Angle split a match, and then Angle wins the belt, and then Joe can challenge for the belt, or this or that. But apparently that's where they're going. Angle's a TNA champion, and, and really... He should have won when I really think about it because he he won the belt at the last show or whatever and he became the first TNA champion and they immediately stripped him and I thought <laughs> off to a flying start boy this TNA belt I mean just the the whole idea of the TNA champion it's like it's a comedy belt well let's review this belt has now been awarded or stripped three times and yet no one has been pinned for it yet this belt. What are you talking about three times? It's been well, stripped it, once. It, 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 uh, Kurt won the NWA title. They awarded him the TNA title. Then they immediately stripped him of it, and now he won it again without pinning anybody. Okay, yes. But anyway, the point was he, he, he was stripped of the belt, and at least he ended up getting it back. So yes. Kurt's the first TNA champion. Everything's fine. Fine. So, um, but yeah, apparently they're going to go with, with him and Joe. And, and the match was fine. I gave it actually three and a half stars. There was a lot of action. There was a lot of stuff going on. It was all. It was a lot of stuff that was cool to watch and look at. There was AJ taking a giant bump off the cage to a table. There was Harris doing a, a diving clothesline off the cage on the angle in the ring. There's all kinds of cool stuff happening. Harris spearing Christian off the ladder so Kurt could get the belt. It, it was just. It, there, there was a lot of n- cool stuff to look at and, and to watch. It just. It's impossible to keep track of who was on whose side or what made sense. It was hard to enjoy it because you had to think too much. Yes. And and I think, you know, obviously one of the things with wrestling is you just want to watch it. You just want to watch dudes fighting. You don't want to have a pad and paper and announcers constantly having to remind you about who is legal and who's not. But anyway, it was uh, it was good. And, and like we said, the main event was good. The opener was great. The second match was great. And, you know, I, I like the uh, Eric Young match, too, except for the stupidity of the immediate cutaway. So, really, I mean, aside from, uh, and let me say one more thing about the cutaways real quick. Many, I mean, WWE does this, TNA has done this, the immediate quit, uh, cutaway after the main event on a pay-per-view. To me, that's okay, because you're cutting away and you're telling everybody, tune in to Raw or Impact to see the aftermath. That's the key. You're tuning in to see the aftermath. The show's going to open with a recap, and then you're going to see the aftermath on TV. When you've got a match like like uh, Rude and Eric Young, don't do that. You've got three hours. Give everybody three minutes, even two minutes. 120 seconds is a long fucking time for an aftermath. Let the people see it. Let it sink in. Let the announcer scream. Show the shots of the crowd. Show the dude laying there in a pool of his own blood. Let it sink in. You don't need to cut away immediately to fucking see people talking. Especially when what they're talking about is a match on a pay-per-view you've already purchased. Yes. Cut a video package here and there. It doesn't matter. The video package for, for Sting and uh, and, and uh, whoever his opponent was, Chris Daniels, did we really need to see that? There was a Daniels promo on the show that we didn't need to see. But we didn't need to see it. So uh, th- This was... On the whole, I give the show a, a thumbs up, but there was a point here where I looked down and thought, Jesus Christ, there's still an hour and a half to go on the show. That's bad. That is bad. So anyway, if you, if you get a chance to get a replay, you may want to see it, just for the fact that it is the five-year show and there are some good matches on it. So not a bad show, but there were some things on the show that, that hopefully they'll think about and, and, and fix because they're completely absurd. So. They had one match. That's fine. We talk about the short matches all the time. It was a three-way match. It was Angle versus Christian versus Rhino. It was Angle's title was on the line. It also would get the winner would get the not only the title but also birth and whatever they call them, the wacky champions match of the pay-per-view. So they had the three-way match, the match of champions, the match of champions. It. Ah, very innovative. Yeah, but uh, they had this three-way match that appeared to involve no less than twelve men and perhaps yeah. a girl or two. I'm not sure. But that's the gist of why it drove me crazy. Well, it, it, uh, the idea was we're going to have a long match, apparently, was TNA's idea. 
So they signed the. This is the other thing. Is, everything is just so complicated in TNA for no good reason. There's going to be a match of champions. That's what it's called. The match of champions. All four champions are going to be in a match together, and and whoever gets a pinfall wins the belt of whoever he pinned. So if somebody pins the TNA champion, he's the new champion. If somebody pins one of the tag champs, he gets to choose a new partner as tag team champions. Or I guess if, if Bubba Ray Dudley pins... Samoa Joe, Bubba Ray Dudley is the new X Division champion. That would be killer. A lot of different options here in this match. But anyway, the way it works is here, you know, they can't just make it simple and go, the four champions are going to face off at the pay per view, whoever they may be. Easy. Instead, they're like, well, the four champions right now are Kurt Angle, um, Jay well, Lethal. It was Jay Lethal. It wasn't after this show, but Jay Lethal. And Team 3D. So, in order to get to the pay-per-view, they're going to have qualifying matches. You must win your qualifying match in order to go to the pay-per-view. The qualifying matches were, in fact, championship matches. So if you lost the championship, you wouldn't be in the Night of the Champions. They couldn't just say, you have to not lose the belt before the (laughs) pay-per-view. They had to make... So 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 Kurt Angle versus Christian versus Rhino ended up being called a qualifying match. When actually, it was just a championship match. Right. And the winner was going to be in the Night of the Champions. So anyway, complications as always in TNA. So Kurt Angle, Christian, and Rhino for the belt. I believe we had approximately five commercial breaks. And I may be uh, understating that. There may have been six to eight. And... It started out all right. Actually, it started out horribly, now that I'm actually looking at this. It started out with with a brawl. I guess uh, Joe was going to do commentary. Oh, I forgot all about that part. But he came out and, and shook everybody's hand except Angle, who he jumped, and they brawled all over the building. Now, maybe at some point here, they announced this was a no-DQ match. I didn't hear it say. I didn't hear them say it once. Now, you know, people have, have gotten mad... Brian, you've got to stop fast-forwarding through entrances. Brian, you've got to pay attention to the matches. I hate to break the news to everybody, but i got a limited amount of time in my life. <laughs> and uh, I don't have two full hours with commercial breaks to be watching some of these goddamn shows. And I'm typing reports as it happens. Well, because, because writing a report by hand of a show, A, would cause more problems, and B, I'd have to then type it up later. It just ain't happening. I'm going to watch the shows, I'm going to fast forward through the entrances, and I'm going to type it up as I'm going along. So yes, sometimes I miss stuff, but you know what? The point of it is, I'm not the only human in the world who doesn't watch the entrances. I was just going to say. I'm not the only person in the world that turns the channel during the commercials, okay? This should not be a situation where stuff is is hidden uh, after the commercial breaks before they come back to the regular show. There should not be a deal where the rules are announced once during ring intros and never again. Okay? If you're having a match and it's no DQ, you'd think the announcers would refer to this numerous times throughout the match. This match is an hour long. What would have happened if I would have just been a casual fan and I would have tuned in, you know, 35 minutes late? They announced it at the top of the hour. Is it my fault I tuned in 35 minutes late? What about all those fans that tune in late? You need to hammer all of this stuff into people's heads. People used to hate the old 20-minute WWE promos that opened up the show, where a promo that could have taken place in three minutes took place in 20. But the point was, at the end of that 20 minutes, you had no questions. Right. You had no questions. If you tune into the show five minutes late, you'd still know everything. If you tune into the show ten minutes late, you'd still know everything. If you tune into the show 15 minutes late, You'd still know everything by the end of this promo. In TNA, apparently, if you skip an entrance, you're fucked. You are F and A. You just sit there and you go, okay, why is there a three-way and Joe is now beating Angle all over the building? Perhaps the answer is that the bell hasn't rung yet. Well, if that's the case, where the fuck security? They don't give a shit that their main event is being ruined by this big fat Samoan beating the sky all over the building? That should be a concern. Apparently it's not. So they beat each other all over the building for a few minutes, and then finally a bunch of geeks come out, and uh, Angle gets thrown back in the ring, and, and you'd think, okay, well, 
The story is that, that Kurt Angle got beaten all over the building. He's the champion. He's now at a disadvantage. Nope. He got thrown back in the ring, and he just stood up and was ready to wrestle. Yep. <laughs> no ill effects of this he's beating all off. over the building. He's a gold medalist, goddammit. Yeah. So he's, he's fine. They this kicked, just wasted eight minutes of my life. They kicked you out of the building, and then the match began. So they did a bunch of moves and, and uh, spots and, and double double clothesline spots, if you can imagine that. And, and all of a sudden, table is in the ring. Huh. Why is there a table in the ring? I don't know. Maybe at some point during a break or, or last week, uh, somebody mentioned this was a no DQ match. I sure didn't hear it. Did you hear it? About 40 minutes into this match, they mentioned it. They did mention it. They did, they did mention it, but it was after the table and about six minutes come out. Oh, well, at least they mentioned it at some point. I missed it. I'm sure some other people did as well. But anyway, the point was we then had a table. Why was it no DQ, by the way? Oh, no reason. <laughs> it was just not a disqualification match? I, I, they, they may have mentioned something about, and I may be making this up. But... Wait, was there a match where, like, Angle got disqualified to save his title? No. Oh, wait, I forgot. You, you lose the title on a DQ. Oh, yeah, yeah. Something about... Uh, Cornette thought the match was too important to end in a DQ or some such bullshit. And so it was too important to end via something that they've stated in their own rules, that you can lose the belt on a DQ. Right. <laughs> Don't look at me. I didn't do it. I'm just trying to explain it to the best of my limited ability. I thought that WWE needed a continuity editor, and I have been proven wrong. TNA, apparently. Uh, if TNA does not need a continuity editor. They need a continuity constructor. There, there's nothing to edit right now. There's no continuity. It's a void. So they they did a they did more stuff, and that's when people began running in. We had Abyss. A marathon came to the ring. Abyss hit the ring, and uh, and he attacked Christian, and then out came Styles and Tomko, and then there was some more brawling, and there was actually a point here where uh, oh then Chris Harris came out. So we had Chris Harris, Tomko, and AJ all brawling, and this was what they were focusing on, the cameras. The three men not in the battle. Right. So this brawl continued all over the place, and then Abyss came back, and then out came Sting. Which, Here is where I started to hate it. To which Mike Tanay actually screamed, why is Sting getting involved? Goddamn good question. So there was now a... Battle Royal when we came back from commercial. Eight men were fighting in the ring. In the ring, folks. Not eight. a ringside, not in the crowd. No, there were eight men in the ring. Eight men were in the wrestling ring in this three, three-way three world title match. And they were hitting each other and such. And so finally, finally, you know, after all this bullshit, everybody leaves the ring except Angle and Rhino. Yes. And they proceeded to do some awesome stuff. Sure. And the place was going crazy, and they were jumping up and down and cheering and clapping, and this was the best part of the match. And as it was getting great, James Storm came out. The cowboy. Man number nine. He spit beer in Rhino's face. Kurt rolled him up and got the pin, and boy, did that piss off the crowd. They've been watching a great match for a moment there, and it was ruined. And and, and Don West was outraged. He couldn't question how James Storm could ruin this match by interfering in a classic, and I swear to God, I grabbed my belly and laughed like Steve Austin. I was howling at this line. That there's been interference. <laughs> he was the sixth person <laughs> to interfere. There was a point in this match well, where... Don West can handle five men. There's a limit. There's a drop. <laughs> there's always, you know, there, there's always got to be a... I, I once had an argument with Yeti. We were working out. We, this is already comedy. <laughs> the we first were, time, by the way, the f- very first time I ever met your friend Yeti, your your car broken down or something, you called Yeti to come get us. And Yeti climbed out of his car, and you pointed and said, that man works out his legs every day. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked down, and his legs not terribly muscular. That yeah. was Yeti. That was Yeti. But we were doing the bench press, right? And we were doing an HST-style workout where you add weight every week and... You know, eventually it gets to the point where, where uh, you know, it's getting real heavy and maybe you can't add any weight, even like a pound. And, and, and Yeti was trying to say that... I love what Yeti argued. <laughs> he was trying to say that, that the human animal, I guess, 
always finds a way to improve. Really? So, like, if... <laughs> no, just bear with me. So, if, like, the world bench press record was 1,000 pounds, right? He was like, well, someday someone's going to do 2,000 pounds. Okay. And I was like, Yeti, um... Don't don't you think that like once once the record is nine hundred ninety nine pounds, and then someone just barely gets it to a thousand pounds, don't you think you've reached about the upper limit of 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 the ability of human beings to lift a weight? And he's like, no, it can always go up ever so slightly, so that eventually someday will somebody will be benching two thousand pounds. And and my argument was, Yeti, well. The reality is that that it, it that's that's a fine notion, but everybody like um, I think there's a certain weight where you'll just be crushed. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the weight is so heavy that the, the human, human body is just is just crushed. The bones humans will not be pressing jetliners in the future. No, but apparently he thought that there there would always be very very minuscule improvements, as opposed to there actually at some point being a limit. And I don't know what the limit is, maybe 1,014 and three-quarter pounds that no man can ever surpass, or at least for decades. But anyway, the point is, Don West has a limit of men that can interfere, and apparently that limit is five. That was a long tangent. <laughs> and any man above five, he's appalled. Outrage. Yeah, not he's... four. If four men are involved and the fifth man gets involved, he's okay with that. But the fifth, the sixth man on top of the five, that's just too much for Don West. Yes. James Storm ruined a classic, he said. A classic. Yeah, it, let, let me get this straight. TNA wants want, this. This match is so important that TNA wants to to avoid bullshit. So uh, they 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 rule it no DQ, which just encourages bullshit. Uh, TNA thought this match was so important that at one point for like two minutes, the focus was on Christian and Abyss and Tomko and Styles fighting in the back. You'll know only one of these men is in the match. Meanwhile, Angle and Rhino were doing like a a a, a, a steeper spot. Like it could have been a finish. And it was not on television. Yeah, I think that live, all the stuff that happened in the back, nobody could see. So there were just long stretches of a chin lock in the ring, and stuff was going on backstage, and I don't know. And there was a great point where, where somewhere when there was eight men fighting everywhere, and, and, and Tomka was bleeding for Christ knows what reason, and, and all of the havoc, Kurt Angle just grabbed a chin lock and said, we're just going to sit here and yeah. wait for this storm to blow over, and then we'll do stuff. So anyway, this was the best and worst of TNA, really, because there was some stuff on there that was actually really good, and and a lot of stuff that actually was very not really good. So anyway, that was that. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend that TNA show. It was not the best impact of all time. That's for goddamn sure. I didn't find it as, as horrifying as Vince, but and I will say this: if that's a preview of two-hour shows, TNA is going on the ban list. Fuck that. <laughs> Fuck that. That's great news. If TNA matches, you know, everyone complains about short matches. If this is the idea of a long match, I'm I'm more happy with the short matches, to be quite honest. You have to get them over with and out of the way. Yeah, get them over with and, and get on to your usual post-match bullshit, which is the usual uh, way that TNA writes their TV. Can't you just have a match? Can't you just have a match? Two men or, or three men or two teams, they have a battle. At the end of it, one of them is declared victorious. Then you go to commercial. No, it's too difficult. No one... The whole idea here was we got to build up all these matches on the pay-per-view. And, and really, you know, I'm, I'm sure that when they wrote everything down, it was like, okay, we set up all these feuds, but I'll bet a ton of fans watched that and can't even remember who Sting was attacking. I have no idea. Or why he came out, or, or who, who Storm hit with a bottle, or, or any of that stuff. I have no idea what Chris, Dan- or Chris, Dan- Chris Harris was doing out there. I don't know who he hates or, or why he wants to fight them. No, but apparently this was... This was uh, you know, and none of these matches were signed, by the way. We still only know about the match of champions. They they can't just like sign uh, like a fanfare when we see that, like trumpets blowing. They can't just sign like Rhino and and Chris Harris, or I'm sorry, James Storm. And James Storm, you know, maybe hits him with the bottle during the match and pins him, and thus Rhino wants revenge at the pay per view. I know that's <laughs> hey, I, sorry to do the fantasy booking here. I know that's crazy, but that was just one of the ideas that popped into my mind. Ryan, you, some wacky. You don't understand the modern audience. I don't. I don't. It's all about shades of gray. It really is. It's it's all about whatever the fuck that match was that I've already forgotten. Anyway, I guess Kurt Angle won. <laughs> I just had to think about that for a minute. Who cares?